So I want to talk a little bit about something that's probably esoteric for a lot of people, but I think is something that the world desperately needs, as you saw in this video. Priorities are a big deal. We have to figure out what our priorities are as a species as we go deeper into the century. As you saw in the video piece, energy sits at the nexus of quality of life, healthcare, food, water, all these things. And we also know, statistically speaking today, that electricity is going to be the driver of most of that energy. And when you look at electricity today and at the forecast forward, we're going to double our demand by mid-century. And that's going to mostly come from the underdeveloped part of the world. So we're looking for a solution that can scale and that can do it carbon-free, if we can, and ultimately be benign in every aspect accretive to our life. Just be economic, just be free of sort of any kind of radioactive byproducts in terms of, of course, carbon output zero. That's what we're all about. As you saw in the video piece, take a clue from looking at the heavens. There's about 100 billion stars in our galaxy. There's about 2 trillion galaxies, as we basically know. So we're talking an astronomical number of fusion reactors in the sky. That's what permeates the universe with energy, and that gives us all of our life energy. It also makes all the products uh, that we're made of. All the atoms come out of nuclear furnaces. And in fact, what stars do, as does our sun, they take hydrogen and the light elements and fuse it together and build. It's the great builder of the universe, right? And it sets free in that process an enormous amount of energy by Einstein's famous E equals mc squared. Now, what do you need to do fusion terrestrially or anywhere? What do the stars do? They operate in a vacuum. The space is the ultimate vacuum. We don't quite have that here. We have to make vacuum containers. We need fuel, fuel of the light particles. Think hydrogen. Think variants of hydrogen, deuterium, tritium, heavy forms of hydrogen, and so on. We also need heat. We need a very hot environment. The interior of a star is about 15 million degrees. Turns out, terrestrially, we need about 100 million degrees to cook fuel. So it's extremely hot. So heat is one aim pod, but more importantly is confinement, which is once you have the heat in there and you've got the soup of super hot material, how do you keep it hot? And one of the things I can tell you, what makes it so hard, however, makes it so safe. Confinement being the problem with this material being hot, but touching a wall of much denser, cooler stuff, it cools out instantaneously. So fusion reactors have one big advantage over our nuclear cousins, they won't suffer a meltdown. Everything stops when confinement ceases to function. And so our big problem, our gap today from having fusion and having an economy built on, a, on, on great contributing uh, fusion reactors is confinement. And this is basically where, uh, call it naive or not, we have created a company 25 years ago, to uh, the first private company to do that out of the University of California, to follow this quest. What you see here is, in fact, our fifth generation machine. We call it Norman. It's in honor of my PhD mentor, who was an absolutely brilliant uh, physicist in, in the space. And uh, we are one clock strike away from actually making net energy in our next machine. In fact, if you look at our journey so far, you see a cadence of devices with ever more ambitious objectives. We're currently operating the one in sort of the middle that we call Norman. I tend to call this the prototype. What's prototype mean here? This has proven that the science can work. We can actually make confinement today, believe it or not, at about 75 million degrees in a facility in California every day about 60 times. We fire this up, we create the fireball inside, we maintain it, we don't let it touch the walls until we turn things off and it gradually and gracefully decays. And during that time, we can create the kind of sustained conditions we need to eventually scale it up by less than a factor of two to get to a machine that we call Copernicus, which we hope to have up running, we're in, on the construction right now, by about mid-century, I mean mid-decade. And that's going to go to show that we can get net energy. Net energy in the sense, um, not what happened at Livermore last uh, Christmas, which most of you may have seen. This is a big weapons research facility, but also does fusion research in California under the auspices of the US DOE. And they, for the first time, got a little bit more energy out of the plasma than what they fed into the plasma. And by the way, plasma is just sort of this hot fuel ball. Turns out, in this machine, we're going to measure it much more stringently. We're going to see the power coming from the grid versus the power that comes out of the reactor needs to be net positive. We think we can do this somewhere around 25, 26. And everything that we've built so far, both on the science and the technology, says this is possible. So the question, what comes next, and how quickly can that then scale and make a difference? And that's where our journey goes towards the late part of the decade in the early 2030s, where we think we can have a machine that we call Da Vinci today, that we've had on the drawing board for quite a while, to actually make net electrons. And I think this is the, the, the wonderful thing in the, in, the, in the US that the private sector, together with academia and the government, is now working to push that last leg of turning laboratory insights and success into functional products. Now, from there on, of course, it becomes a journey that will involve everybody here. How do you bring something like that at scale to meet the challenges that we talked about earlier? How can we create copious, reliable, 
power out of a source that doesn't generate carbon, that doesn't have radioactivity associated with it, that doesn't have resource constraints. The light particles like hydrogen and other forms of hydrogen, boron, lithium, they're everywhere. So it's not a question of uh, are they concentrated only in one part, they're available to everybody. That's a huge democratizing force. And one, when solved correctly, gets you into an age of abundance in perspective of energy. I think this is the exciting question to ask. What happens when you have that technologically, but how do you bring it out to the world? And this is where I appeal to all of you to think and, and consider that fusion isn't sort of science fiction anymore. We're very, very close in doing this, and I'm 100% convinced within the next five, maximum 10 years, we'll be at a point where we can make a first net electron prototype that connects to the grid. To take that from there, deeper into the century, of course, we'll take an effort to globalize supply chains, to create the kind of industrial backbone that can steal this up, but that's what we're about to do. And I think with that, you will get not only what the science fiction books call the dawn of the fusion age, but really a, a world where conflicts of resources, constraints of energy, scarcity that defines today in so many ways the half and half nots, the access to healthcare again, food, water, all those fundamental human, human things, they will start to get set free on a scale that will see us suddenly struggling almost in a way with thought those scarcity constraints, which is a wonderful opportunity, right? And when we get to that, it really enters us into a new paradigm. And so I want you to pay attention to that as we go deeper into this decade, as you will see from us and a few others in the private space, that step happening from the lab into the actual application and eventually out, hopefully in a copiously available energy source for the future. Thank you very much.